I wondered, uh, Leah, what that sound like without instrumentation. Listen, listen. We lift our voices to worship God. My hallelujah belongs to him. Let's try it, Leah. My hallelujah belongs to you. Come on. <laughs> My hallelujah belongs to you. Mm -hmm. My hallelujah belongs to you oh yes it does my hallelujah belongs to you he deserves it you deserve you deserve it you, you deserve it you deserve it you deserve it. My hallelujah, my hallelujah. My hallelujah belongs to you. If you really mean it, come on, sway like you mean it when you sing it. My, my hallelujah belongs to you. Come on, y'all. All over this place we sing. My hallelujah belongs to you. When I think about how good you've been to me, God. Mm. My hallelujah belongs to you. When I think about how you kept me from danger seen and unseen. My hallelujah belongs to you. When my body got wrecked with pain, God, it was you who healed me. My hallelujah belongs to you. You deserve it, Lord. Come on. You, you deserve, deserve it. You deserve it, God. You deserve it. Mm. You deserve it. You deserve it, God. You deserve it. Hallelujah, Lord. You deserve it. You deserve it, God. You deserve it. Mm. You deserve it. My hallelujah. You deserve it. My hallelujah. My hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah, God. My hallelujah belongs to, to you. Now, come on, if you believe it today, come on and give God the best praise you can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless his name today. God is good. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be alive. <laughs> Woo. Look at Matthew 27. Here it is, you all, verse, Matthew 27, verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They have two choices, Barabbas or Jesus. And they said, Barabbas. Governor answered, said to them, which of the two do you want? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus, who's called Christ? And they all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. Watch this. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water 
and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. Mm. I want to I wanna preach today. Can you take me to verse 22? Verse 22. Pilate said to them, what shall we then do with Jesus who's called the Christ? And they all said to him, let him be crucified. I want to preach today, what shall we do with Jesus? Before you take your seat, I want you to look at somebody and ask them, what shall we do with Jesus? Mm. Wow. Be seated in the presence of God. The Armory, good to see you, son. Slide over to the middle, if you will. The Armory, thank you, son. September of 2008, September of 2008, during the Republican convention, Vice President candidate Governor Sarah Palin, in an effort to diminish Barack Obama, she tried to diminish him as a community organizer, and she said something in her acceptance speech that she tried her best to put shade on Barack Obama. Um, she wanted to, in fact, put shade on the fact that as a role of a community organizer, she said during her acceptance speech that she once served as the mayor in a small town in Alaska. She goes on to say, I guess you wonder what does the mayor of a small town in Alaska do? Guess you wonder what does the mayor of a small town in Alaska do? Well, she said, I guess being the mayor in a small town in Alaska is like being a community organizer with one caveat. You have responsibilities. And the Republican convention approved of her comment, and with an uproar, they applauded. Obama, and ain't nobody like him, was quick and pointed in his response. He said, in your attempt to bring down the community organizer, let me remind you, Governor Palin, that Jesus was a community organizer also, and the person that condemned Jesus was a governor. Mm. Which brings us to our text. The governor that condemned Jesus, his name has gone into infamy. Not because of what he did, but because of what he refused to do. Pilate was a governor that was appointed by the Roman Empire to supervise this very volatile region of the empire known as Palestine. There were some stubborn Jews who occupied the territory. They were unwilling to submit themselves to the Roman rules. Thus, Rome not only stationed a garrison of troops there, a place called the Fortress of Antonia, but also placed there was a governor who had dual responsibility. His first responsibility was to maintain law and order. He was to maintain peace. It was called the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. His second responsibility was to ensure that tax dollars being levied against the people of Palestine would somehow flow into the coffins of Rome uninterrupted. Pilate was ruthless, and he ruled with an iron fist. Any would-be rebel was dealt with quite harshly by Pilate. 
As a matter of fact, you all, there's a verse over in the gospel um, of Luke chapter 13 that gives us a hint as to just how ruthless Pilate could be if anyone dared to interfere with the interests of Rome. I want you to look at Luke, y'all, chapter uh, 13, verse 1. It's on the screen for you. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. He said about this time, Jesus was told that Pilate was given orders that some people from Galilee to be killed while they were offering sacrifices in the temple. Which meant, you all, that Pilate suspected some Jews who were engaging in rebellion and sedition while they were in church offering sacrifices, Pilate sent his troops into the church to kill those seditionists while they were in the very presence and the very process of worshiping God. Y'all, I'm trying to get y'all to see Pilate ruled with an iron fist. If you study the gospel. They seek to give us an accounting of the trial of Jesus. So we're told, we're told, you all, that early one morning, a mob led by the religious leaders of that day awakened Pilate early in the morning. The mob said to Pilate, we have a real seditionist on our staff. Forget about the people you thought were um, seditionists. Back in Palestine, they are nothing compared to this guy. We have a real rebel, a real threat to the Roman interest. They bring in this bearded carpenter from Nazareth who claims to be a king. The bearded carpenter is being defiant against the emperor. Pilate, we want you to put Jesus to death. So Pilate said, okay, I need to interrogate him first. So he interrogates Jesus. We're told there were three interrogations, three interviews that Governor Pilate had with Jesus, and each time Pilate concluded the same thing. In John's Gospel, regarding the account of the trial of Jesus, right around chapter 18, verse 38, Pilate asked Jesus as a part of the interrogation what is truth? Pilate goes back out. He says, um, I've interrogated him, but I don't find this man guilty of anything. I wish I had some Bible readers here. There was, however, another interrogation in John chapter 19, verse 4. Watch the story. Pilate therefore went forth again, said unto them, I will have Jesus brought out again, and then you can see for yourself. I have not found him guilty. But then, y'all, there was a third interrogation. Watch the text, Troy. In John chapter 19, verse 9, Pilate went in again into the judgment hall. Now, the reason he goes the third time, y'all, is because of what we see in verse 6 of John chapter 19. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out saying, man, crucify him. Crucify him. Nail him to a cross. Mama, this was interesting to me because a few days earlier, Jesus was entering into Jerusalem and the same mob was saying, hail him. Now the mob says, nail him. I want to put a pin here and tell you, y'all, it don't take folk long to switch on you. I, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I want you to know it doesn't take people long. They might be on your road, but they could be with you one minute and the very same minute turn their back on you. P P Pilate says to them in verse 6, watch verse 6, y'all. Pilate says in verse 6, you take him and nail him to a cross. I don't find him guilty. I find no fault in him. 
Watch how he responds to Pilate in verse 7. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And he ought to die. Watch this. Because he made himself the son of God. Ah, man. Yo, he made himself the son of God. So Pilate is now trying to figure out how he can wiggle his way out of this. Even though, even though Pilate was ruthless, he always had a sense of justice. Did not want to condemn an innocent man. But he also, Larry, was a politician. And you know, Politicians are politicians. As a politician, Sister Connie, he was more concerned about his career, more concerned about the polls, more concerned about political expediency. Y'all, he was more concerned about what's more appropriate to be done. So he has a dilemma on his hands. He came up with a brilliant idea. He said, I know what I do. There's always a provision that during Passover in which he would offer the people a person to be set free. Y'all, there was a period where he would grant amnesty to a hardened criminal. So he goes and he finds the worst criminal, the worst terrorist that there was. He finds Barabbas. In the early Greek manuscripts, y'all, of the New Testament, his name is not simply Barabbas, but Bar, B-A-R, Bar is the Hebrew word for son, son, B-A-R. Pastor, I thought Bar was, no, that ain't what Bar is. <laughs> bar is son, son, son. Abba, A-B-B-A, Abba, is, y'all, the word for father, father. So his first name is, watch this. Barabbas' first name was Jesus. So his name was Jesus Barabbas, which meant, y'all, that Jesus Barabbas, son of the father. Mm. That's his name, Jesus I, I ought to just tell you all this. Um, Jesus wasn't the only person named Jesus in the Bible. So there are others who were named Jesus too. And in this instance, Barabbas, whom we know him by more so than his first name, Jesus, his name was Jesus Barabbas, which would mean then his name would be Jesus, son of the father. Now, he's a terrorist, Barabbas, and he's a murderer. So Pilate says, I'll bring him up from the dungeon and I'll present this murderer. I'll present this terrorist to the people because I know if I give him a choice between Jesus, who's called the Christ, and Jesus Barabbas, they gonna pick Jesus, who's called the Christ, to be set free. So on one side is Jesus Barabbas. On the other side is Jesus, who's called Christ. Pilate knows that the people will certainly not want to release Barabbas. He's certain about the people's choice. But the problem was he underestimated the power of envy. See, y'all, he underestimated what hate can do. So Pilate poses the question, who shall, watch the text, y'all, I release unto you. Watch this, Stephen. He says, Jesus Barabbas, terrorist, murderer, or Jesus who's called Christ. And the crowd, under the influence of the religious leaders who hated Jesus, all cried out, give us Barabbas. Pilate was shocked. Pilate asked, um, what has he done? And, and, and with tumult, the Bible says they cried out, give us Barabbas. 
Pilate said, okay, I'm going to do what y'all want, but it's on you. It's not on me. He then had a call for the basin. Bible says he washed his hands to symbolize that he is innocent of the act that's about to go forward. As they release Barabbas, there stood Jesus. And here it comes, Deacon Yvonne, right here. As, 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 as they released G, uh, uh, Barabbas, Jesus is standing there. And Pilate comes and he asks the question, what shall I do with Jesus who's called Christ? Now those of us who understand what went on at the crucifixion of Jesus understand that this was not some ecstatic event. Those who understand what took place at the crucifixion understand that this was not an event that took place once in history, but it's an ongoing parable. Troy, the names have changed. The date has changed. The location has changed. But the story is as contemporary as anything you're going to read in your daily newspaper. Every generation has its mobs. Every generation has its pilots who are willing to do the political expedient thing, who are willing to do the convenient thing and not the courageous thing. And, and, and the question, here it comes, that Pilate asked is a perennial question. Perennial, perennial question, perennial question. That's spelled P-E-R-E-N-N-I-A-L. That simply means you all, a question that lasts forever. Perennial, perennial question. Now watch this, y'all. It's, it's an ageless question. What shall? Listen, Carolina, what shall we do with Jesus? What shall we do with Jesus who's called Christ? <clears throat> Y'all, I submit to you that this question is one, perennial, but two, it's also personal. Yeah. It's a personal question. Y'all, this is not a question for your mama. This ain't a question for your daddy. It's a personal question for you. What will you do with Jesus? Watch this. Not only is it perennial, ageless. Not only is it personal for you. But it's also a pressing question. Y'all, pressing, pressing. See, some of you will say, I, I won't answer that today. Well, let me help you. Not to answer is an answer. Y'all, it's so pressing that if you don't answer, you have already answered. You ignore Jesus, which becomes your answer. You are just ignoring Jesus. No, hold on. Not only is it personal, not only is it pressing, but how about it's also a pertinent question? Yo, it's the most pertinent question that could be asked. Pastor, why is it so pertinent? It's pertinent because what you do with Jesus today will decide what will happen to you in eternity. Mm. What you do with Jesus today will determine what Jesus will do with you in eternity. Woo, man. Y'all, I want to do it again. I said, whatever you do with Jesus today will have major implications of what will happen to you in eternity. Are y'all with me? It's a pertinent 
question. Okay, I'm going to show it to you. Uh, go, take me over to Luke chapter 12, verse 8 through 9. Luke chapter 12, verses 8 through 9. Luke chapter 12, verses 8 through 9. Here it comes. He says, um, also, I say to you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. Wait for it. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. In other words, y'all, I'm going to put it like this. Demetrius, good to see you, honey. Here it is, y'all. He says this. If you diss me down here, I'm going to diss you up there. So now the question is, y'all, what are we going to do with Jesus? What are we going to do with he who's called the Christ? Y'all, this question is so pertinent because what you do with Jesus today ultimately determines what Jesus will do with you in eternity. All right. Watch what they said. They said, um, crucify him. Now, I want to ask a question, Deacon Stanley. I want to know, when they said crucify him, why didn't Pilate stand up for Jesus? Be careful. Be careful. Pointing the finger at Pilate. Why, 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 why didn't Pilate, why didn't, why didn't he, why didn't Pilate stand up for Jesus? Why did he, why did he reject Jesus? What were the factors that shaped his influence as he wrestled with the question as to what to do with Jesus? Here's why I want to, because I believe, I believe that those same factors are shaping our influence in the decisions that we make for or factors against Jesus. Watch this. Factor number one, voices. Don't have time to work through it all. Watch this. Voices. The voices that confronted. Y'all, voices that confronted Pilate. That, that's the first piece, y'all. That's the first factor. Voices that confronted Pilate. When it comes to your decision as to what you will do with Jesus, y'all, there are some voices that are confronting you. Push the rewind button. When it comes to your decision as to what to do with Jesus, there are some voices that are confronting you. The first voice that confronted Pilate was Pilate's wife. This is the voice that confronts. Watch this. Matthew 27, verse 19. Watch the text. Matthew 27, verse 19. It says that while Pilate was judging the case, while he was interrogating Jesus, his wife sent him a message saying, watch your voice, y'all. Honey, don't have anything to do with that innocent man. Mm. No, don't, yeah, y'all, y'all, Pilate's wife is even saying that Jesus is innocent. And she asks her husband not to get caught up in this situation. She tells him, she tells him that, y'all, she's had some nightmares because of Jesus. Y'all, I'm going to put a pin here, put a pin here. I'm going to tell the husbands here today, listen, let me help y'all with something, y'all. Y'all, y'all, stop trying to dismiss your wife's advice. Because sometimes, y'all, y'all, the woman knows what she's talking about. You just so caught up in your own ego that you don't want to listen to her. Y'all, I, I, I at least thought I didn't have to wait, put my sign up that the women would be clapping right about here. She's saying to him, leave him alone. I've had some nightmares about Jesus. In other words, Pilate cannot say that no one war didn't warn him. God raised him a witness to, to that Pilate that might know who Jesus is. He said, 
Leave him alone. I, he's an innocent man. I've had nightmares about him. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking to somebody right now in here today who's not yet made a decision for the Christ. Somebody has been witnessing to you, sharing with you how urgent it is that you do something with Jesus. You can no longer say that no, nobody has ever witnessed to you about Christ because that's not true because God sends you a voice. Somebody who sounds the alarm and tells you that it's time to get right with God. There's always a voice. Might not be your wife. It might be your husband. Might not be your father or your mother. It might be someone who's just trying to tell you that you need to change. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I've come to tell you God's sounding the alarm. He's using the voice to say, this might be your time to change because voices will confront you. I want to suggest to y'all that God always has a voice. Sometimes he'll use the raggedness of people to speak into our lives to get us to where God wants us to be. Don't ignore the voice. This voice confronted Pilate. But there was no doubt another voice. And that was the voice of his conscience. Yeah. Pastor, are you sure? Deacon Reg, three times Pilate came to realize that Jesus was innocent, that Jesus was not guilty. And that was his inner voice trying to convince him. I want to suggest to y'all that there was a still small voice speaking on the inside of Pilate saying to him, now you know you're wrong. Guess what, y'all? When we are wrong, there's an inner voice in us that says to us, now you know you're wrong. Now we might try to rationalize it, justify it, or even ignore or push the mute button on it. But God has put in every one of us a sense of right and wrong. He's given us a voice that nobody hears but you. There was a voice that confronted Pilate. And right now, there is a voice that's confronting each and every one of us as we seek to decide what are we going to do with he who's called Jesus the Christ? Yo, 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 what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do with the voices that keep saying to us, you're wrong. Stop it. Back away. I know your ego talking to you, but you, 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 your ego said, but you know you the man. You can get away with it. You got time. Let me help you. Listen to the voices that confront you. What we going to do with Jesus? What we going to do? What we going to do with him? What are we going to do with God's word? Are we going to ignore it? Or will we ascribe to the word? Voices that confronts. His wife spoke. Um, uh, his conscience spoke to him. Okay. You didn't like voices that confront. Let me see if you like this one. How about values that conform? See, in spite of the voices of his wife, in spite of his own conscience talking to him, Pilate, Pilate capitulated to political expediency. Pilate decided to turn his back on Jesus, and he signed the death warrant. Let me help y'all. Pilate's signature is on the death warrant. What is it 
that conformed Pilate, though? What made him sign the death certificate? What was it that shaped Pilate? Y'all, here it is. It was his values. Your values will always shape how you feel about Jesus. See, what we know about Pilate's values that caused him to reject Jesus, we know that Pilate didn't stand up for Jesus because he was a people-driven person. He was a people-driven person. Watch Mark chapter 15, verse 15. New Living says this, y'all. So Pilate, anxious to please the crowd, wait a minute, release Barabbas to them. Did y'all see what I just saw? Pilate was anxious to please who? Y'all, so he released Barabbas. Y'all, if you are a people pleaser, then you are more concerned about what people think than about what's right in the sight of God. Okay, y'all, I got to quit, but let me give y'all this. Take this back with you. Here it is. If you please God... It does not matter who you displease. But if you displease God, it does not matter who you please. Y'all ain't helping me. Y'all, I'm sorry. Pilate was a people pleaser. And too many of us are walking around here trying to please the people and do what the crowd says we ought to do. When really, y'all, you ought to do what the Lord says ought to be done. If it comes down to it, y'all, I want to be right in the sight of God. Because people don't have a heaven nor a hell to put me in. So if I please the people, it doesn't have lasting impact. It's only temporary. But if I please God, then God is going to give me eternity and my impact will last forever. If you please God, it does not matter who you displease. But if you displease God, it does not matter who you please. That's my time. I got to go. Everybody stand with me, please. Everybody stand. What are we going to do with Jesus? I I know what he said. What are we going to do with him? Mm. Nelson, come on, son. What are we going to do with him? Are you going to be like Pilate? And compitulate to the crowd? Or will you stand up for what's right? That's what God's asking us to do in this place today. To stand up for what is right. I don't want to please the crowd. It's only temporary. I want to please God. Take it, son. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together. Give God praise.